One year ago, a black man named George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His death was caught on video that spread all over the country, the world, and set off a huge demand for justice for black lives. What you're looking at right now is our camera taking a walk uh, through uh, live images here, a celebration of life for Floyd happening right now at Revolution Hall in Southeast Portland. We do expect this crowd that you see here to start marching any minute now. This is the latest of hundreds of protests in Portland in the last year. And tonight, we're taking a look at how much has changed in this year since George Floyd's death. Thanks for joining us on KGW News at 5 o'clock. Portland made national headlines, of course, throughout the past year as people protested police brutality. So what progress has the city made since that tragic day a year ago? Here's Morgan Romero with a look. Don't shoot! This is Portland one year ago in the days following the killing of George Floyd. People filled the streets to protest police brutality, to push leaders for reform. We have done so much in the past year. I am grateful for that. But let me be really clear and say I have concerns. Portland's mayor says the city made reductions and investments which advance police reform and reinvestment in community safety. Just weeks after Floyd's death, the city council stripped the police bureau of $15 million, cutting three units, including the gun violence reduction team. The council diverted the money to community programs assisting people of color. But police union president Daryl Turner argues it shouldn't be one or the other. We should be doing both. Mayor Wheeler came up with a 19-point police reform plan. 13 have been addressed, like moving the Equity and Inclusion Office under the chief. Six are still in the works, including a ban on chokeholds. A lot of the things that people were asking for, we had already been doing here at the Portland Police Bureau. This year, PPB will get the biggest cuts of any city bureau. The budget slashes $9 million in money from the general fund. The agency will have to cut several vacant positions. You can't defund an organization and expect them to be able to make changes uh, with less money, with fewer officers, and without the, uh, the uh, ability to serve the public in the way the public wants to be served. New money is proposed to grow the unarmed community service officer program and pay for the Portland Street Response pilot program for another year. It sends unarmed first responders to answer calls for the homeless. Activists wanted it expanded. We see that it is not getting the support that it needs to really be able to scale and to show that transformation of public safety as we know it is going to happen. The budget backs the police accountability measure voters passed in November. It created a completely independent oversight committee with teeth to be able to investigate police malpractice and also to be able to recommend and implement new policies within Portland Police Bureau as a whole. Reforms aren't only reflected in the budget. Portland changed its approach to record high gun violence, with four million for community groups and another million for unarmed park rangers. Resources were also shifted to enhance investigations. Yes, activists say Portland's leaders listen to some demands, but agree there's still work to do to protect black lives. I am calling on folks to reflect now that we are a year past and realize that justice and that better future that we all want and deserve, it's gonna require our renewed action. It's gonna require our persistent presence. Morgan Romero, KGW News. More than 30 states have passed police reform laws since George Floyd's murder. People closest to him say it's not enough and they're vowing to keep working for change. I would keep fighting this fight. They would, they would never forget George Floyd's name because I would not allow them to. George Floyd's sister, Bridget Floyd, declined President Biden's invitation to visit the White House today because he has not yet signed the Justice and Policing Act. The teenage son of a triple murderer in Cowlitz County is now accused of killing his stepfather. 17-year-old Brent Leister Jr. was in court today. <laughs> He is accused of stabbing and killing his stepfather, Luther Moore. He was arrested on Monday at a home in Amboy. According to court documents, he went to a neighbor and told them that he had stabbed Moore. 
His father, Brent Leister, killed three people and injured a fourth in a shooting in Woodland in 2016. He also tried to break out of jail in 2017. Justin, Multnomah County has been approved to move to low risk, and that starts on Thursday. Governor Kate Brown announced the decision an hour ago. In addition, in addition to having 65% of the population vaccinated, counties have to have an equity plan approved by the state to move to lower risk. That plan outlines how counties will reach vulnerable populations. We talked today with Multnomah County's Public Health Director, Jessica Guernsey. She says the biggest piece in that is bridging the trust gap between government health and communities of color. This is our focus in public health anyway. Um, the equity gaps exist with chronic disease and other communicable diseases, and that is really where we've been refocusing for the last couple of years. Um, so this isn't just about COVID and rebuilding community trust. It's about everything else that's going on for communities that are you know, directly related to, um, like I said, historical wrongs and discrimination and systemic racism. She says some of their plans to make vaccines more accessible are already in the works, like dropping the need to schedule an appointment to get your shot and bringing vaccinations to vulnerable communities. There are now 13 counties in the state at this lowest risk level. Less than two weeks into the new CDC mask guidelines, and we've got to say it's been a little confusing, I think, for all of us. State officials in both Oregon and Washington have blamed some of the trouble on the way the CDC put out the new guidance, without warning, really. Remember, it allows fully vaccinated people to not wear a mask in most indoor situations. But how do you know who is vaccinated and who is not vaccinated? Washington, they went with the honor system for that, which makes some people worry. Oregon put vaccination verifying on businesses, which has not gone over well. Many are just not doing it at all. And Governor Kate Brown is hearing about it. I've certainly heard concerns from the business community, from retail workers and others. I'm certainly committed to refining our approach here. Brown has also just heard from House Republicans. They put out a letter this afternoon calling on her to drop the verification uh, requirement. Now, one common denominator for both states is a fair number of businesses are keeping mask requirements in place for everyone for now. A Portland dairy facility and ball field could be turned into a big housing development, and neighbors say it would be a loss for more than just them. Galen Etlin takes us to Alpen Rose Dairy. Even in a downpour, Deborah Harrison walks her dog around the grounds of Alpen Rose Dairy in southwest Portland. This is where I get my strongest sense of community is right here. She's disappointed to hear two companies have submitted a plan to redevelop the dairy, ball field, and velodrome into a subdivision of 193 homes. It feels really tragic for this, this area because it is such a, a center for community and people just come and see each other. You see your neighbors every day. It's tough. Yeah, it really is. Mike Workman volunteered at the ball field and Alpen Rose facilities for 25 years, inspired by his work as an umpire for youth teams in the softball World Series held at the stadium. He and his wife also helped decorate for big community and holiday events. It's just a sad time. It really is. Yeah, and, and I don't think anything can be done to resurrect it. I don't think historical factors will come into play. That history is complicated. Alpen Rose Dairy sold the business to Smith Brothers Farms in 2019, which operates the dairy now. But former owners of the dairy, descendants of Florian Cadeneau, retain rights to the land and facilities. That means if this housing development plan goes through, the dairy business would have to move. What makes Alpen Rose special to the community? A lot of people would tell you that three generations of their families have gone to the dairy. KGW reached out to Lennar Northwest and Westlake Consultants, the companies behind the plans, but did not hear back for an interview. The plans are tentative. They could change or not happen at all. But neighbors like Deborah Harrison hope history plays a part in what happens next. If it could be developed, bought and developed as a park, I think that would be a huge boon to everyone in this area. Galen Etlin, KGW News.